we tend to see them, not just the people whose figure in history books, Adams, Jefferson, Thomas Paine, Benjamin Rush, and of course Washington, we tend to see them as sort of figures in a costume pageant. It's often the way they're portrayed. And we tend to see them as much older than they were because we're seeing them in the portraits of Gilbert Stuart and others when they were truly the founding fathers. And furthermore, none of them had had any prior experience in revolutions. They weren't experienced revolutionaries who'd flown in to take part in this biggest of all events. They were winging it. They were improvising. At the time of the revolution, they were all young. It was a young man's, young woman's cause. George Washington took command of the Continental Army in the summer of 1775 at the age of 43. He was the oldest of them. Adams was 40. Jefferson was all of 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. George Washington had never commanded an army in battle before in his life when he took command. And he wasn't chosen by his fellow members of the Continental Congress because he was a great military person. He was chosen because they knew him. They knew the kind of man he was. They knew his character, his integrity. What Washington was above all was a leader. He was a man people would follow. And as events would prove, he was a man whom some, a few, would follow through hell. And he would not give up. He would not quit. The army was totally demoralized. They'd been defeated. They were soaking wet. They were cold. They were hungry. And by the time Washington started his big retreat, his long retreat across New Jersey, they were down to only a few thousand men. That's all. Well, Washington took stock, just as the British Army was taking stock of what the situation was, and most every officer and all the politicians, many of whom had fled from Philadelphia by this time. And most everybody concluded that the war was over and we had lost. It, it was the only rational conclusion one could come to. There wasn't a chance. So Washington did what you sometimes have to do when everything's lost and all hope's gone. He attacked. They went up the river Christmas night, nine miles up to McConkie's Ferry. They crossed the Delaware. He had the nerve, the courage, the faith in the cause to carry the war once more to the enemy. And they marched nine miles back down the river on the eastern side and struck at Trenton the next morning. It was a fierce house-to-house, -house, savage battle, small in scale, but very, very severe. And it was all over in about 45 minutes, and we won for the first time. Now, it wasn't a great battle like Brooklyn. This was a small engagement, but its consequences were enormous, beyond reckoning, because of the psychological effect it transformed the attitude of the army and of much of the country toward the war. And in that, it was a pivotal turning point. Washington, the political general, had never forgotten that Congress was boss. When the war was at last over, Washington, in one of the most important events in our entire history, turned back his command to the Congress. No conquering general had done that before. When George III heard that George Washington might do this, King George III said, if he does that, he will be the greatest man in the world. So what does it tell us? It tells us that the, orig the original decision of the Continental Congress was the wise one. They knew the man, they knew his character, and he lived up to his reputation.